It's my pleasure to introduce my colleague Vasis Assessors from UT Arlington today to introduce to talk about his uh, recent research on the similar based BS neighbor retrieval and mm. the application on computer vision database. So sure. yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you all. Thanks, Jinbing, for inviting me, and thanks to everybody for coming, including you guys. <laughs> so I'll try to look at everybody. It seems like the crowd is fairly small, so let's keep it interactive. If you guys have any question or some term is not familiar, just you know, ask me. At the same time, I have to say I'm not going to fully describe every single thing that we did in every single project because that would probably take three hours. It did take me three hours when I first went over the material. So I'm going to skip over some of the details, but if you think that something is missing, just ask me and I will go over it. Um, also, I always put this as the second slide to make sure I don't forget. You know, there's a lot of people that I've collaborated with on the projects that I'm going to talk about. I was a PhD student at Boston University like Jingbin, and I definitely worked a lot with uh, my advisor, Stan Scarf, and my co-advisor, George Collius. And then there's a lot of other people, professors, postdocs, students, and so on, that I've collaborated with on the material that I'm going to, to talk about today. Um, so basically, just to kind of start off the talk, the topic here is uh, similarity-based uh, search in multimedia databases. So this is a pretty diverse topic. It's not just a single problem. It's a family of problems. It depends on whether you want to search for video, audio, or different types of data. But at the same time, there are systems out there, real systems that serve users that need to perform this kind of search operations all the time. And doing it efficiently is an important issue because this can easily become a computational bottleneck. And at the same time, this is an active research area. There is a lot of work out there, I mean, by lots of different people. And we have also done some work in the area I'm going to talk about. And so it turns out that a lot of times, by just using certain nice methods, we can do a lot better than just brute force search. And especially in our work and in the stuff that I'm going to talk about today, uh, our strategy is that we found that in a lot of these problems, we can lots of times find mapping methods that map the original hard to deal with multimedia objects to vectors that are easy to deal with. And then all of a sudden, the multimedia search problem becomes a vector search problem that is much, much easier to control and to solve efficiently. So I'm actually going to talk about three different uh, projects uh, that we have been working on. So the first project is kind of the, in the more classic setup of nearest neighbor retrieval where you have a database of stuff, like for example here we have a database of images of handwritten digits, and then you have a query image for which you want to find the nearest neighbors in the database for purposes such as, let's say, classification. And this part of the talk actually focuses on how to do this task efficiently when the distance measure that you use is not a simple Euclidean distance measure but a more complicated thing that is usually more computationally expensive. So it turns out there is quite a lot of computationally expensive distance measures that we will talk about. And we have built a method that explicitly is designed for this kind of measures. So just to throw out some of those measures, is things like dynamic time warping, the edit distance, Kalbach-Leibler distance, bipartite matching, shape context matching, things like that, earth movers distance. Uh, the second part of the talk will address the problem of subsequence matching, efficient subsequence matching in databases of time series and strings. So for example, here you can see a very coarse graphical representation of some uh, time series that's supposed to be a long time series in the database. And when you have a short query, you would like to find the subsequence in the database that is the best match. And you have the same version of the problem for strings. For example, this could be at the bottom a DNA sequence that has millions or billions of letters. And you submit a sequence up here for which you would like to find the best subsequence match. And finally, the third part of the talk will address, um, will I will present a method we have developed for efficient recognition in domains where you have uh, thousands of different classes to recognize. So suppose that, for example, you guys would like to, uh, for the Google Images product, you would like to have a system that actually, whenever you detect a face, you try to recognize if it's a certain celebrity, right? A politician, an athlete, an actor, and so on. So the list of possible people you might want to recognize could easily run to the thousands or tens of thousands or something like that. So we have a method that would show how to try to recognize all these people in a more efficient way than the typical way that just says, OK, is it person A? No. Is it person B? No. Is it person C? No. And as I said before, the common theme in all these three problems is that we will describe uh, mapping methods that can reduce all these 
kind of hard search problems into easier problems that are, for which there are much more straightforward ways to deal with. So we start with the first problem, which is nearest neighbor retrieval under computationally expensive distance measures. So the setup here is fairly traditional. You have a database of objects. So you can think that every one of your objects can be an image, or it can be a time series, or a string. And then you have a query object, and you want to find the k most similar objects in the database for that query object. So our focus here is on computationally expensive distance measure. So I always find it easier by first explaining what is not a computationally expensive distance measure. So let's consider the Euclidean distance, right? So suppose that here we have a vector in d dimensions that is just basically a bunch of numbers, d numbers. And we want to compare this vector to this vector according to the Euclidean distance. So basically, if we have d dimensions, it takes o d time, right? It's linear to the number of dimensions. So this is what we consider cheap. I mean, you cannot really do better than that. It's pretty hard to compare two objects un unless you look at them, which already takes o d time. Now, here's an example of a computationally expensive distance measure. So the idea is that if you want to compare two strings to each other, you cannot do the same thing that you did with the Euclidean distance, right? So you cannot just compare the first letter with the first, the second with the second, and the third with the third, and so on, because this will not be quite meaningful. In order to have a meaningful estimate of this distance, it's important to find an optimal alignment that tells you what parts of one string correspond to what parts of the other string. So this is, for example, what the edit distance does. That is probably the most common distance to be used for strings. And because it has to search for an optical alignment, it is super linear in time. So the edit distance in particular takes time that is quadratic to the length of the strings. Uh, another motivating application in computer vision, which is my primary area, is let's say you want to establish a meaningful similarity measure between these two images. So in order to do that, it's really important to know that let's say these two regions correspond to each other and these two regions correspond to each other, and so on. And just to give a concrete example that was actually motivation for my thesis work, uh, back about eight years ago, Belongi and Malik at uh, Berkeley, they proposed a similarity measure that they called shape context matching that uh, they applied on this kind of data set where basically you have a database of 60,000 images of handwritten digits. And basically, the goal is to use this kind of data set for classification and see how well you can recognize new test digits. And they proposed a measure that basically would extract 100 features from each image. And then they would use bipartite matching, which is a graph algorithm, for finding the optimal one-to-one -one correspondence between features in one image and features in the other image. So the catch is that uh, bipartite matching is cubic to the number of features. So what was really impressive, and this is a very, very popular work in computer vision, is that uh, basically shape context matching gave the best error rate ever. So it was just a simple nearest neighbor classifier according to this distance measure. And it gave far better results than some really, really complicated machine learning algorithms that were applied to this data set. The, uh, the problem is that because exactly the, this measure is computationally expensive, to actually classify a single 28 by 28 image, like the ones that are shown here, it took over an hour. So to measure the distances between a single image and 60,000 of these images in the database, it would actually take over an, hour, over an hour. And I verified it myself. I implemented this as part of my thesis. I heavily optimized it. And this is pretty much the number that it took. And as a preview of the results, by applying the methods I will talk about today, we got this number down from 66 minutes to about 5.2 seconds using indexing methods. And the error rate just went slightly up from 0 0.54 to 0 0.61, which at least back then would still have been the best possible result. Now I think they got it down to 0 0.4 using some other methods. But again, you can never win with these things. So, and again, as I mentioned, more examples of computationally expensive distance measures include dynamic time warping, the edit distance, the earth movers distance, the Kalbach library distance. And obviously, these measures are non-Euclidean, right? We're not really dealing with vectors, let's say, when we measure the edit distance on strings. But it's important to mention that some of these measures are also non-metric, right? So for example, dynamic time warping and the kalbach leibler distance, they don't obey the triangle inequality. Actually, yeah, the kalbach leibler distance is also not symmetric. So essentially, then, this means that a big part or a big fraction of indexing methods that have been proposed out there cannot be applied to these data sets. So most of the metho indexing methods in the database community deal with vector spaces. So popular methods like locality sensitive hashing or PCA or KD trees, VA files, they basically they assume that your data is vectors. 
Um, there is also a family of methods that are metric methods, like different types of trees, VP trees, M trees, many different types of letter plus trees in it. Uh, that basically, they are not designed for vectors, but they're designed for metric spaces. So they use the triangle inequality to prune away candidate matches, and this way they speed up the search. Now, even when your space is metric, in practice, again, like pretty much anything in database indexing, some, in some cases they work really well, in some other cases they don't quite work well. But it's also important to mention that if your space is non-metric, then basically these methods become inherently heuristic, and usually they break down pretty badly. So the method that I will talk about, it's actually um, a special case of uh, the embedding family, so the family of embedding methods. So it's kind of useful to take a brief look at how those methods work. So the idea is that you start with your database objects, or your space of objects overall, and you want to come up with a magic function, f, that maps every object to a d-dimensional vector. Right? So we will talk about how to construct this function. So, but the idea is that once you have this mapping, then given your query, you also want to map it in this d-dimensional space. And instead of measuring distances in the original space, which is computationally expensive, and this is exactly what we want to avoid, you measure distances in the embedding space, which is much faster. So hopefully this will give you quite a big gain in efficiency. Of course, the caveat is that this embedding must preserve a big amount of the similarity structure of the original space. So the nearest neighbors that you get here should be ideally heavily related to the nearest neighbors that you would get in the original space. Um, before I actually talk about um, a standard way to do this, I should mention probably many of you are familiar with things like ISOMAP or LLE, local linear embeddings. Uh, those embeddings are typically not good for nearest neighbor retrieval because to embed the query, you typically need to know the nearest neighbor of the query. I mean, these kind of embeddings are extremely useful for other things like uh, classification or visualization of complex data. And, but, it, but they are not really targeted for the problem of efficient retrieval. They are more targeted for efficient visualization and efficient classification in these complex spaces. Right, so the idea is that if you can afford to find the nearest neighbors and then according to those do another mapping that will give you some information about the space, those are great things to do. But if you just want to find the nearest neighbors themselves, they don't really address that because they do nearest neighbor as part of their algorithm. So, a trick that uh, has been used in the database community for quite a long time is what is called reference object embeddings. So suppose that out of the entire database, you just pick some objects, even randomly if you like. So in this case, for example, we pick three objects, just to illustrate the example. And then you define the following function. For every x that is an object in your space, you define a vector that's composed just by, that's basically you form just by measuring the distance from x to each of the reference objects. For example, here we have three reference objects, so by measuring those three distances, we get a three-dimensional vector. So this is a kind of simplistic, but easy to visualize example, where our space is the set of geographic locations in the US. Now admittedly, this is an extremely simple space. It does not compare to the more complicated spaces we actually want to index. But at the same time, it serves to show that this kind of embeddings, they convey some useful information. So suppose that here we choose as our reference objects, Los Angeles, Lincoln, Nebraska, and Orlando, Florida, right? So suppose that you know nothing else about the US except for the distances from every place to these three reference objects. So if for these five cities, for example, you just know these three numbers, you can still get some useful information, right? You can still tell, for example, that Sacramento is much closer to Las Vegas than it is to Washington, DC. So this is kind of an, an example that shows the intuition behind reference object embeddings. The idea is that in most spaces, even though they can get far more weird and complicated than this space, it typically holds that similar objects, objects that are close to each other, they tend to have similar distances to other objects. So that's kind of the information that reference object embeddings capture. So this kind of trick has been used for at least 15 years as far as I know, possibly even more, to speed up nearest neighbor retrieval. And again, like everything else, in some cases they work well, in some cases they don't work quite as well. Um, in our, in our work, basically, uh, our contribution is was, it's a new method for optimizing such embeddings. So basically, the key questions that we tried to answer was, first of all, what makes an embedding good or bad? So what is a good measure of embedding quality? And two, if we agree on such a measure of embedding quality, how can we actually optimize an embedding according to this measure? So 
And this is the kind of thing that happens when you have uh, machine learning, computer vision people trying to do databases that we still try to see it as machine learning problems. So it actually turned out that our approach was a machine learning approach for solving this database problem, where essentially in our mind, we saw embeddings as classifiers. So of course, in order to treat them as classifiers, you have to come up with a classification task. So the classification task is the following. Suppose that um, I give you triples of objects, Q, A, and B. So typically, Q is a query, and A and B are database objects. And I ask the question, is Q closer to A or to B? This is a binary decision problem, right? So it's either closer to A or to B. Now, if you're picky, there can be ties, but we kind of ignore them because they're really, really rare, and you can just ignore them pretty much. They don't really make much difference, at least in our data sets. So essentially, then, for example, you know, if all you know about the US is these numbers down here, then suppose I ask you, so is Sacramento closer to Las Vegas or to Washington, DC? And you have to answer just by using the embedding. So in that sense, any embedding defines an estimator for this task or a classifier that just answers by checking if f of q is closer to f of a or to f of b. right? So in that sense, our criterion is that the good embedding should answer this question correctly as often as possible. It turns out that it's, no matter what you do, if you have a complicated enough space, you will always make mistakes with your embedding. But the idea is that the fewer those mistakes are, the more this embedding preserves the nearest neighbor structure in, in the original space. For example, suppose that in the theoretically ideal case, you have an embedding that always answers this question correctly. Then this embedding perfectly preserves nearest neighbor structure, right? It would never reverse the ordering. Basically, it, re it, it preserves similarity structure in general. Nearest neighbors, farthest neighbors, everything. So overall, by minimizing the errors on these triples, we can come up with a good embedding. So just to give a mathematical definition for how this estimator would work that is kind of useful, essentially, if you have an embedding f that maps you to a vector space, all we have to do is take the distance between f of q and f of b and subtract from that the distance between f of q and f of a. So basically, if f of q is closer to f of a, you say that then this answer will be positive. So overall, positive results here mean that q is closer to a. At least that's your estimate. And negative results would be interpreted as q is closer to b. Now, once we set it up this way, let's see what happens if your embedding is a single reference object. So for example, suppose that your embedding is just distances to Lincoln, Nebraska. right? And you want to answer questions about is Sacramento closer to Las Vegas or to DC based on just their distances to Lincoln. So you will get several wrong answers. For example, according to this embedding, if you see here, it looks like LA and New York are much closer to each other than they are to Detroit or Chicago. But you will also get a lot of the answers right. For example, you will get it right that Chicago is closer to Detroit than to either New York or LA. And statistically, you will get more right answers than wrong answers, right? So this is a binary decision problem. So if you just flip the coin, so if you had no idea about the answer, you will still get it correctly 50% of the times. But the idea is that here we don't make a totally random estimate. We actually use a little bit of information. So we'll make mistakes, but we should still do better than a random guess. So then basically, we, the other thing to note is that if you have a large space, so a large database, every object in your database will give you slightly different information. So each one of these objects in the database can be used as a reference object. So overall, we can define lots of different classifiers, weak classifiers, by using these objects. So basically, then, we come up with a fairly common machine learning problem, which is that we have many weak classifiers, and we want to combine them into an optimized strong classifier. So for those of you who have a machine learning background, you know that the standard answer to this is use a boosting method. And pretty much this is what we do. We use Adaboost, which is probably the most popular boosting method. And I'm pretty sure we could use other methods as well. It probably wouldn't have made much of a difference. So essentially, what we do is we tell Adaboost, OK, here's a bunch of triples for which we have already spent the time to compute the original distances. So we know for all those triples if q is closer to a or to b. And here are some thousands of possible reference objects to use. So each of those reference objects defines a weak classifier. And then we run Adaboost, which what it does is that it typically chooses a certain number of these reference objects. So it chooses a certain number of weak classifiers. And it creates a linear combination of these weak classifiers. And it also assigns a weight to each of the weak classifiers. So for the purpose of this talk, we can just use Adaboost as a black box. We don't really worry about how it does it. It's sufficient to know that 
this is really a problem that, that it is designed to solve, how to combine many weak classifiers into a good linear combination. And of course, the goal is to minimize the classification error on triples, which is exactly the optimization criterion that we wanted to, uh, to use. So basically, Adaboost, it produces a classifier that is optimized for telling you if Q is closer to A or, or to B. But what we really want to do is to get an embedding, right? So remember that each of the weak classifiers that are chosen by Adaboost corresponds to a refer reference object. So if we just take those reference objects, so let's say Adaboost chose 100 reference objects. So if we just define our embedding to be those 100 reference objects, then essentially this will be the embedding that we want to use. So we just take the reference objects and we concatenate them here and we define what we call a boost map embedding. This is just a cheesy name because we use Adaboost and we produce a mapping. Now, once you map objects to a vector space, Another question is, what is the right distance to use between those vectors? And it turns out that the right distance to use is a weighted Manhattan distance, or L1 distance, where the weights that we use are simply the weights that Adaboost assigned to each of the reference objects. So the nice thing, if we set it up this way, is this. So suppose that I take a triple QAB, where Q is closer to A than to B. Okay? Then the classifier that is constructed by Adaboost will make a mistake on this triple and it will tell you that Q is closer to B if and only if this embedding under this distance measure will also do the wrong thing. So basically, the classifier will tell you that Q is correctly that Q is closer to A than to B if and only if the embedding really maps F of Q closer to F of A than to F of B according to this distance measure. So essentially, if let's say you got really, really lucky and Adaboost produced a perfect classifier, this automatically translates to a perfect embedding. Or overall, if Adaboost did a good job and it really optimized this classification error, you will get a high quality embedding. So once we have an embedding, then we actually, ideally we want to use it in some system to do something useful. So the way to use such embeddings uh, typically falls within the framework of what is called filter and refine retrieval. So the idea is that the embedding maps objects into vectors. So at first, by just comparing the mapping of the query to the mappings of the database objects, you can produce a small set of candidates, right? So even if this set uh, includes, let's say, 1% of the database, that was still a big gain over having to evaluate the entire database. And then at the refine step, you just compute the exact distances to just those candidates. So in many of our data sets, actually pretty much in all the data sets we have tried, the refine step pretty much takes all the time. In many cases, actually, it is faster to measure 60,000 or 100,000 Euclidean or L1 distances in this step than to measure a single distance in this step. Now again, if this wasn't the case, there's also a lot of vector indexing methods like, again, PCA, LSH, KD trees that you could apply on top. But we found that just doing brute force in the vector space was sufficient because the main bottleneck was measuring distances in the original space. So. Here is uh, the examples of the results that we got on the MNIST data set of handwritten digits. Uh, as a reminder here, shape context matching that was based on bipartite matching gave a classification error rate of 0.54%. But measuring the distance between the query and 60,000 database objects takes over an hour. And here is a table of results that we got with our method with some competing methods. I guess we can highlight, so the method that I just described here without really any changes, it cuts it down from an hour to a bit less than a minute. Oops, sorry. And the classification rate just goes slightly up from, essentially the difference between 0 0.54 and 0 0.58 is four test objects out of 10,000. So it wasn't really a big deal. Uh, actually, a method, a slight variation of our method that I will not talk about today because I just want to give a brief overview. So by doing some more tweaks in our method, we get it down to five seconds with an error rate of 0.61%. And it's important to mention, so VP trees are a well-known metric method. It works pretty poorly. I mean, it just gives us a speed up factor of three. It cuts it down to 20 minutes. Condensing is a method where you basically say, okay, I have a huge data set, so I can just throw away some database objects. And I do this in a way that tries to preserve classification accuracy. So that actually, it got us down to about a minute, but the error rate was 2.4%, so much, much higher than the 0.54% before doing condensing. 
And also, interestingly, there was a method by Zhang and Malik um, in CVPR 2003 that was actually explicitly designed to speed up classification using shape context information. So essentially, in that method, uh, the cost of classifying a test pattern was equivalent to measuring 50 shape context distances to database objects. So that method basically could classify a query in 3.3 seconds, uh, and the error rate, but the error rate went again pretty high up to 2.55%. And by applying our method, which basically it knows nothing about shape context, it just uses it as a black box. It uses the distance measure as a black box. We got, for the same amount of time spent per query, the error rate was 0.83%. So it was kind of interesting that using our method and applying this to shape context as a black box, we could actually do better than a method explicitly designed for that distance measure. And we actually got a similar result on another uh, public benchmark data set, the Unipen data set. So basically in this data set, uh, every object is a time series representing a character that you write with a stylus on a PDA device. Right? So basically because you write with a stylus, it actually knows the order in which you put each of the marks, so it produces a time series. So here we use dynamic time warping as the distance measure, which again is very similar to the edit distance. It's quadratic to the length of the time series. And just to show a, uh, the, a summary of the results here, by using brute force we get 1.9% error rate, and it takes about 12 seconds to classify a single character. Uh, there was a method proposed by Balman and co-authors in PAMI 2004 that, again, was explicitly designed for speeding up online character recognition, this kind of data, uh, whose error rate was 2.9, it, but it basically speeded up con considerably the classification time to 0.16 seconds. And by just applying BoostMap to this data set, we got actually slightly faster classification time, actually less than half the time, and also a better error rate. Again, there's tons more results in my thesis and in the journal papers that we have produced on this topic. Um, OK, so I guess just to recap very quickly, the main contribution that we have made here is that we proposed a different method for optimizing embeddings that is based on machine learning. Uh, the formulation is domain independent, so pretty much the formulation doesn't care about what distance measure you have to use. As long as it's a computationally expensive distance measure, this will just try to map it to a vector space so as to produce you, to give you a way to do efficient, an efficient filter step and find candidates very fast in the filter step. And at the same time, we found that it has worked very well in practice. And in several cases, it has actually outperformed methods that were specifically built for specific distance measures. OK, so that was the, pretty much the first part of the talk. Uh, the second uh, problem that I'm going to talk about today is efficient subsequence matching of time series and strings. So I'm actually going to start with a problem on strings. So suppose, for example, that here you have a, at the bottom, you have a database that has long strings that come, let's say, from DNA uh, representations. So here you can easily have uh, a string whose length is millions or billions of letters. And then at the top you have something shorter. So again, it doesn't have to be six letters. It might be 50 or 100 or even 1,000 or 10,000. But typically it's much smaller than the chromosome. So it's part of a DNA that, let's say, a biologist wants to look up and see what other parts in other DNA sequences it is most related to. So this is what we call the subsequence matching problem in strings. So the edit distance is a pretty standard distance for measuring distance between strings. Essentially, it says, OK, if I have a sequence at the top and a sequence at the bottom, what is the smallest possible number of insertions, deletions, substitutions that I can apply to convert this string into this string. For example, here, what we need to do is make a substitution for A to C, and we need to delete T to convert the top string to the bottom string. So the edit distance is two. We just need two operations. Another common distance measure, actually similarity measure that we use for strings, is the Smith-Waterman measure. Uh, the main difference between Smith-Waterman and the edit distance is that the Smith-Waterman measure basically it doesn't really try to align the whole string with the, at the top with the whole string at the bottom. It just looks for parts that overlap as much as possible. And it kind of works by giving bonus points whenever you have matching letters and giving penalty points whenever you have mismatches or gaps. For example, in this case, this seems to be the optimal overlap, where basically if you match this A, G, T, C at the top with a T, sorry, A, T, T, A, C at the bottom, 
it turns out that the A matches the A, so that gives you a bonus of two points. The G is mismatched with a T, so that's a penalty of one point. You have a bonus of two points here. You have a gap here. You have another bonus of two points here. So overall, the Smith-Waterman measure would give you a measure of four here for the similarity. So this is a similarity measure. The higher it is, the more similar the two strings are considered to be. So although these are different, uh, the Eddie Dees and the Smith-Waterman in terms of formulation, it turns out that the algorithm for computing those is really, really very similar and this, it depends on dynamic programming. So the idea is that we create a table where the x-axis corresponds to uh, the long database string and the, uh, the y-axis corresponds to the query string, let's say. And then the key thing is that we basically fill in in a for loop for every ij position in this table, we compute the following answer. What is the best, so, for, so basically if this is i, so i would be 3 here and j would be 8 here. So what we would like to compute here is for the first three letters of the query, what is the best matching string ending at the eighth position? Okay. So it turns out that solving this problem only depends on answers that you have already pre-computed for this, this, and this problem. So essentially, this is a typical dynamic programming setup where your original problem can be decomposed into smaller problems. You reuse the, the solutions to the smaller problems. So at the end, basically, if you look at the top row, the top row basically tells you what is the best subsequence match for the whole query ending at this position, sorry, or this position, or this position, and so on. So at the end, all you have to do if you use the edit distance, you just scan the top row at the end and you see where you got the smallest score. So that will show you where your subsequence match occurred. For Smith-Waterman, actually, because it allows partial matches, you actually have to scan the whole table and see where you get the highest entry. So that will show you where the best subsequence match occurs. But overall, these are really very similar algorithms. And for those of you who are working with time series, if any, uh, computing the dynamic time warping distance between time series is almost the is again an extremely similar algorithm. It's exactly the same setup. Now, of course, this algorithm works. So if you want to really find the subsequence match of a query, all you have to do is do this algorithm. But essentially, this is again the equivalent of brute force. So ideally, we would like to do something better than that. We would like a faster way to identify areas of interest, areas of possible matches in the database, and only consider those. So. The trick that we use here is that it's kind of related to the reference objects that I talked about before, but this is kind of, reference objects are an old trick. This trick is something that we just introduced and we have a paper at VLDB in, I guess, next month discussing this, where we extend this to the notion of a reference sequence. So let's see what happens here. So if we used what I talked about in the first part with reference objects, essentially that would not be very useful, right? If we use a reference object, then basically all we have to do, we take the distance from the query to the reference object, so that, that gives us a number. And then, they, then we take the distance from the database sequence to the reference object, which gives us just a number. So essentially you have a chromosome, let's say, with one billion letters, and you get just one number out of it. So obviously this single number is not going to be very useful. right? So the difference between subsequence matching and classical nearest neighbor search is that here the match can occur anywhere in the database sequence. It can start anywhere and it can end anywhere. So in a way, it's not sufficient to just map the entire sequence into a number. We need to map every position into a separate number. So, and the way to do it is pretty much by taking the reference sequence and computing the dynamic programming algorithm, so filling up the entries in this table, right, the way we talked about before. So if we do this, then at the top row, we will get for every database position the cost of the best match between the reference sequence and a string ending at this position. Right? So this number here, it will be the embedding that we will use. So for every position, for every database position, we will map that to that single number that has been computed in this part of the table. For the query, we will do something similar. We will actually match the reference to the query using the dynamic programming algorithm. This number here, it will tell you what is the best match between the reference sequence and the suffix of the query, right? That ends at the end of the query. So this number here will be the embedding of the query. Now, why would this thing be any useful? 
it actually turns out that if we just use these numbers, we can obtain a bound for the edit distance. So basically, the idea is that suppose that I want to know for this query what is a lower bound on the possible edit distance between the query and the best match ending here, starting anywhere before that but ending at this position in the database. So obviously, I can do this by running the full dynamic programming algorithm. But the idea is that if I have pre-computed this embedding here for the database position, and if I compute this embedding for the query, subtracting these two quantities will give me a lower bound for that. For example, if it turns out that the embedding of the query here is 10 and the embedding of the database here is 30, I know that you will never find a match here that is closer than 20 in terms of the edit distance in this position. So basically, this way you can prune out a lot of database positions by just using this inequality. And I have to say here that so our focus so far in our first implementation of this method has been on DNA sequences. And an additional constraint that we have used here that I guess is not always present, but it is sometimes present, is that I guess biologists have indicated in their publications that they mostly are interested in queries where the database, the best match in the database, is not too different from the query. And so basically here we use a threshold and we say, OK, we will only consider cases where the database match doesn't differ by more than 15% of the query length from the query. Because in several publications that we have seen and with several biologists we have actually talked or exchanged messages with, it seems that this is the kind of query that they, most they are most interested in supporting. So a simple version of the algorithm that we perform then is that essentially as pre-processing we choose some reference objects. We pre-compute the embedding of every database position according to each of the reference objects. And then given a query, we pretty much do a filter step as a nested for loop where for every database position, for every reference object, you see if using that reference object, you can prune away that database position. So this is a simplified version of the algorithm that works kind of reasonably well. There is a more complicated version that is actually described in our upcoming paper. But essentially, this is the essence, that by using these simple embeddings, we can prune out large parts of the database. Now, a topic here that is kind of subtle is what is the right length for the reference objects, right? So, so far, we haven't really said anything about whether the queries and the reference objects could be, let's say, 10 letters long or 1,000 letters long. So, one thing to notice is that the way we embed the query, essentially we ask the question, what is the best matching suffix of the query for the given reference sequence? Right? So if, let's say, the query is 1,000 letters and the reference sequence is 10 letters, this number will pretty much only tell us something about the last few letters of the query. Right? So ideally, you would like reference objects to have the same length as the query, more or less, to give you information about the entire query. At the same time, if let's say your query is 100 or more letters and you start using reference objects that are this long, what you end up seeing is what is one of the many symptoms of the curse of dimensionality, which is that pretty much no matter what your query is and what your reference object is, mostly you get the same distances, or the distances don't vary enough. And the problem with that is that if the distances don't vary enough, then the lower bounds that you get here are not high enough. right? So basically, by just trying different things, we came up with a magic number of 40, which just seemed to work very well. Now, so what happens now if you use reference objects of length 40, but your query is really of length 1,000? The answer here is to break the query into chunks. So do whatever we talked about before, but do it with every chunk separately. So find close matches for every one of the chunks. And then the idea is that every close match that you find for a chunk is a candidate for a close match for the entire query sequence. So at the end, you just go back and you evaluate the area around those chunks to see if you find a good match for the entire sequence. And this approach is exact, and it works fairly well. It actually outperforms competitors. I'll show the results in a bit. But it turns out that if your query is really large, you can actually do something better. So here's the question. So suppose I have a really long query, let's say 10,000 letters, and I break it up into chunks of segments of 40 letters each. So what would happen if I only chose a single one of those chunks and I tried to find a close match for just that one and I ignore the rest of the query? How likely, so if I was able to find all the, let's say, I'm only interested in matches that are within 15% of the query in terms of the edit distance. Okay? And suppose that 
So 15% of a query length of 10,000 would be 1,500 characters of edit distance. So now 15% for a chunk of 40 characters would be 6, right? So suppose that I get my chunk and I find in the database all the subsequences that are within an edit distance of 6 from that chunk. So how likely are we to have included in those chunks something that actually include, that is part of the correct match for the entire query. So it actually turns out that by using some fairly simple properties of binomial distributions and under some fairly realistic assumptions, this, the chance of finding, of hitting the match that we're really looking for for the entire BigQuery is over 50%. And which means, and actually if, if instead of a chunk you use two chunks, then the chance of missing it is 0.25. If you use 10 chunks, the chance of missing the correct match is less than 1 over 1,000. So it turns out that actually if you have really long queries, but you know that your match is within a certain range of the query, it actually, you mostly don't need to look at the whole query. You can just look at a few chunks and that will give you a very, very likely to be correct answer. So the experiments that we have run here are with human chromosome 21. Uh, whatever that is, I guess, as far as I'm not a biologist, so this is just some words to me. But uh, essentially, this is a string of 35 million characters. And it comes from, from the human genome. Now, as queries, we use uh, strings from the mouse genome. So we looked for strings in the mouse genome that had matches within 15% at the human genome. And that's what we used as queries. And the similarity measure we used here was Smith-Waterman. So pretty much everything I've talked about before applies both for the edit distance or for Smith-Waterman. You can kind of pick and choose depending on what you want to do. So this is the results that we get. Uh, we tried with query lengths of 40, 200, 2,000, and 10,000. Um, so here, ARBSA stands for the approximate version of our method, where basically if you have a query of length 10,000, that corresponds to 250 chunks of size 40, we only use 10 of those chunks, at least for the filter step. We only look at the remainder of the query to evaluate and to verify that we really got the good match for the whole query. So this is the approximate version. Uh, ERBSA is the exact version, where basically you try all the chunks. BWT is one of the probably most uh, well-known competitors or a state-of-the-art method for matching in DNA, for subsequence matching in DNA databases. And these are three different uh, parameters for BLAST, which is by far the most well-known algorithm for matching in DNA databases. And the numbers next to BLAST indicate the accuracy. So notice that BLAST does not necessarily provide the guarantee that you will find what you're looking for, right? But you can set up its parameters to make sure that your results are correct for, let's say, 95% of the queries, or 98% of the queries, or even 100% of the queries. So these are the three different settings that we tried. So we know that actually for short queries of length 40, BW2 actually did much better than we did, almost an order of magnitude better. Once we go to queries of length 200 and more, actually the exact version of our method, which guarantees finding the correct result, starts performing better. Uh, the interesting thing is that exactly because in the approximate version we really don't need you really only need to look at 10 chunks. It doesn't matter how long your query is. That becomes much, much faster than any of the other methods. For example, for queries of length 10,000, our method took 0.086% of the time it would have taken for brute force search to find the subsequence match here. And for comparison, and our method was correct 99.75% of the times. I mean, again, it's approximate. We only look at 10 chunks. You can always get unlucky. Uh, it, and if we compare this to BLAST with 95% accuracy, it's about 100 times slower. So again, this is just one of the results that we got. With, uh, we got many different results, both with Smith-Waterman and the added distance. We also compared to other competitors like QGrams that also turned out not to work well when your queries become longer. And we have many of these results in our paper that is actually posted on our web pages. Um, okay, how are we doing time-wise? Okay, 10 minutes. So basically, so this is something that we did for strings. We did something, now I mentioned before that if you actually work with time series, 
computing the dynamic time warping distance between time series is really, really similar to computing the edit distance between strings, which means that essentially we can apply the same exact method with reference sequence to time series. So basically, I will fast forward all the details. But uh, again, we tried, again, some results with this. And we had these results in a paper we had in SIGMOD last year, where essentially, let's say if we were willing to sacrifice 10% of retrieval accuracy in finding subsequence matches, we could do about 50 times better than brute force search. OK, and the last part of the talk is going to be switching gears a little bit. So now I'm going to talk about efficient recognition in cases where you have a large number of classes. So again, as an application, or the easiest example I can think of is face recognition. You might want to actually recognize a large number of people in cases where you want to recognize celebrities for a search engine. Or let's say you're in a surveillance system for the police or the FBI, and there is thousands of missing people or suspected criminals that you might want to spot. Another case where multi-class recognition is useful is for things like hand and body pose estimation. So we can take a lot of different poses, thousands or even millions perhaps, with our hands and our bodies. And being able to recognize those could be very useful for things like sign language recognition or human-computer interaction. I guess many of you may be familiar with the Nintendo Wii and how it tries to estimate some motion, right? It would be really cool if you could just do things like that and the computer would really know what you do and give the you know, blow of death to the opponent that you're playing with and stuff like that. So this is another case where it would be nice to be able to recognize a very large number of different classes. Um, one common approach, I mean among many, but this is just one approach for doing this, is what is called one versus all classification, where basically you train a different classifier for each one of the classes. So let's say if you want to recognize Kobe Bryant, you build a classifier that just says, OK, is this Kobe Bryant or somebody else? And that's all it cares about. So if you want to recognize 10,000 people, you build 10,000 of these classifiers. And that's something that actually people have done for multi-class recognition, although probably not for 10,000 classes, partly because not many people have actually tried to recognize 10,000 individuals. And the plus is that each of these classifiers can be trained using a state-of-the-art method, like boosting method or support vector machines, and people are happy with how well those methods work. But the question is, so what do you do when you have 10,000 classes? The standard approach is to just apply each one of those classifiers in sequence, which is not very efficient. So we actually have a method that we can apply on top of a specific uh, OVA-based method, which is called joint boost. So joint boost was introduced by Toralba, uh, Murphy, and Freeman from MIT in 2004. So pretty much it's a boosting method. By the way, just to know how many of you are familiar with boosting methods? One, two. Guys, <laughs> OK. So basically, the idea is that, again, as I mentioned before in the description of our embedding method, a boosted classifier is really a weighted linear combination of weak classifiers. right? So each of the little h's here is a weak classifier. These guys are weights. And this is just an extra term that you can add or subtract for every class to introduce a bias. For example, for computer vision, a simple weak classifier could be something like, sum up all the intensities here and subtract from them all the, inset, the intensities from here, right? So the idea is that this kind of weak classifier is not very accurate, but again, it should be better than random. And you can probably define thousands or millions of, of such weak classifiers, and then add a boost can find the best out of them and combine them in a good, strong classifier. Now, in joint boost, the main difference from the standard add a boost or boosting paradigm is that Basically, if you have 10,000 classes to recognize, you force all those classifiers to use the same weak classifiers. So notice that, let's say, if Y here stands for Kobe Bryant, so this is the classifier that recognizes Kobe Bryant, there is no Y subscript for the H. So the weak classifiers are shared. What is different, so what makes this classifier look for Kobe Bryant and not, let's say, Michael Jordan, is the alphas. right? So the alphas, the weights, are what makes every one versus all classifier different from the other one. They share the same features, the same weak classifiers, but they combine them in different ways. So basically then in the standard approach, if you build 10,000 of those OVA classifiers, you just apply each of them to the query and you decide what person it is. Basically you try to find the one versus all classifier that gives the strongest response. That is the most confident that yes, this picture really comes from my guy. So in our work, uh, we just presented at CVPR uh, last month. It's a more efficient alternative for doing this kind of task. So how can you find the winning classifier without trying all of them? 
So the summary of the approach is that we will define a mapping that will map every classifier to a vector and every test image into a vector in such a way that the winning classifier will map to the nearest neighbor of the query. So let's see how we do that. So if this is the, let's again, if this is the classifier for uh, Kobe Bryant, this will be the mapping to a vector of that classifier. So basically, if we use D weak classifiers, so let's say if we use 100 weak classifiers, the first 100 dimensions are just the weights of those weak classifiers, right? This is what makes this one versus all classifier unique. The 101st dimension would be this bias term. And the 100, so basically, so far up to here, everything is straightforward. We just use the constants that appear here. This extra dimension is a dimension that we will use to just ensure that all our, let's say, 10,000 one versus all classifiers have the same norm, right? So you can always, if you give me vectors, I can always, a set of vectors, I can always add another dimension to them to ensure that they all expand and they cover the surface of your hypersphere, okay? I'm going to skip the math because of time, but this is it, and you can see it in the paper for how to do that. Now for the query image, I will also define a mapping. I will actually define it in two stages. This is a preliminary mapping that we call V original of the query. We're basically, again, if we have 100 weak classifiers, we compute the responses of those weak classifiers, and this will give us the first 100 dimensions of the query. Then the second to last dimension is a 1, and the last one is a 0. Now, why do we do it like this? Basically, if you want to compute the response of this classifier on this query, this is just the dot product between the mapping of the classifier and the mapping of the query, right? If we take the dot product, basically every weak classifier response is lined up with a weight for that weak classifier, right? The bias term is lined up with the one, and this extra term that we added is lines up with a zero, so it doesn't make any difference, okay? So basically, Finding the winning classifier is the same as finding for this particular query vector, the vector among the database vectors that maximizes the dot product. Now, the second step is to take this query vector and normalize it so that its norm is also the same as the norm of these guys, right? Remember that we made sure by adding this constant here that all these guys have the same norm that we call n max. So by doing this normalization, we ensure that this guy also has norm n max. Notice that by doing this, we scale all the dot products between the query vector and the classifier vectors by the same factor, right? So whatever was the winning vector before is the winning vector still. So still, the winning OVA classifier corresponds to the vector that maximizes the dot product. However, one last step is that once we have this mapping now, the V of the, the mapping of the classifiers and the mapping of the query, all of them have the same norm. So they all live on the surface of some hypersphere that is centered at the origin. So in that case, maximizing the dot product is the same as minimizing the Euclidean distance. So have, we have actually mapped, and actually, to our surprise, we just realized later that, hey, this is not something that just works for joint boost or for other boost. In any place where you actually want to uh, find a vector in the database that maximizes the dot product, this way you can map that to minimizing the Euclidean distance. And the nice thing about that is that, well, how many methods do you know for indexing dot products? Personally, I think I know zero. And on the other hand, for indexing the Euclidean distance, there's tons of different methods, so you can just take them and apply them. Actually, there are, I can mention the code by the for example. Uh, really? Okay, that would be interesting to talk about offline, because actually, I was actually looking at the literature, and uh, just one thing to know, do those things assume that they all have the same norm or they don't care about that? Uh, well, it's, it, uh, it, it, it's cosine similarity. So. Right, so if it's, that's the thing. So cosine similarity works only if everything has the same norm. So in our case, we mapped everything to the same norm, but that was our own mapping, right? If you just take the original vectors, they don't have the same norm, so you cannot apply this cosine similarity. So basically, the idea is that, on the other hand, for Euclidean distance, we can all agree that there is tons and tons of methods that you can use to index it. So you can apply pretty much any one of them and try to gain some computational efficiency. And I will skip the details, but basically, we just did a very simple method that's based on PCA, where we basically used PCA. We went to very low dimensional vectors. We found some candidates based on that. And then we evaluated each of those candidates in the original space. And just to show some very quick results, 
we apply this on the uh, data set of handshape images, where compared to joint boost, uh, the speed up factor was 120. And actually, compared to another method that we presented two years ago that we call class map, it was still much faster. That method was, gave a speed up of about 30. And for faces, actually, this is kind of a tricky result with the reviewers. Uh, what it turned out that we had, we took basically the largest face data set we could find, which is the face recognition grand challenge data set that has 535 classes. And there it didn't quite work very well. We, we only got a speed up of 1.6 and for some dropping classification accuracy. Uh, so we actually wanted to look at what's wrong and why does our method work that bad. We found that actually most of the time was spent on computing the PCA projection of the query, which is part of the indexing method that we use. And essentially that is a cost that has nothing to do with the number of classes, right? If instead of 535 classes you had, let's say, 10,000 classes, this cost would be the same, but everything else would scale up. So if we take out this projection cost, then it turns out that we get a speed up of a bit over an order of magnitude over uh, basically just trying every possible we classifier, every possible OVA classifier to see which one wins. Um, so basically, in, in, and this is pretty much the last slide for future work here, this is just a pretty new thing we've been playing with. Uh, the indexing scheme that we use that's based on PCA is probably not the state of the art. So we feel that probably if we try more fancy indexing schemes here, we should get even better speed ups. And at the same time, as I said before, this is a general method for indexing dot products, even in cases where they don't all have the same norm. And that's something that we're kind of interested in finding applications for that. We found that many cases where you build databases using SVD, let's say in the Netflix contest where with SVD you map every user to a vector and every movie to a vector and then you want to find basically the movie that the user would like the best is the vector that would maximize the dot product with the user vector. These are all cases where we could apply this kind of reduction to map it into a Euclidean indexing problem. Um, okay, so I guess this is pretty much it. Uh, thanks for everybody for attending. So, any questions? the distances from the mm -hmm. example or something. Yeah. Uh, so it seems like, uh, if, if I said that you, you take those distances from the example and then you basically use them as your feature vector and then you compute them and have the distances itself. So, right. But you're, it seems like the only, the, the, only, the only thing that you care about as far as those distances are concerned is the relative ordering. So yeah. if, you take, if you took those distances and for example squared them or applied the log or whatever. Yeah, it wouldn't matter. Right, but, but your Manhattan distances then would change. So right. have you experimented with applying different monotonic transformations to this? Uh, no, we haven't, uh, but we could. I mean, this is an extremely valid thing. I always said it at the back of my mind that this would be a nice thing to try. We could even use a hybrid distance by exactly doing these things. You could use things where you part of the distance is Manhattan, part of it is squared, or any power, basically. And yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. The transformations could either come before you take right. the difference or right. after. Right, so basically the idea is that essentially you could even say that if you look at the level of the weak classifier, right, that just looks at distance to a single object, right, you can square them, you can do any transformation to them, right, so in a way that can be used to enhance the pool of weak classifiers, right, and yeah, so that would make sense and I, it wouldn't hurt, I mean most likely it would give you better results, it's just that, you know, I had to graduate, move on to other things, so we never, but this, it would entirely would make sense, if I were to let's say make a product, this is one of the things that would be the first to try to further improve performance. Uh, any other questions? Okay, cool. So thanks everybody for coming. Thank you.